Well, a very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I know it's a little nippy in the Magellan Lounge. I've just told the control room, and they're putting more logs in the burner. So give it 20 minutes, and it'll be a little warmer. Folks, will you please welcome with his uh, fifth lecture of this cruise, Captain Richard Heyman, We're talking about Hanoi. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm wearing my Vietnamese long johns, as you can see here. Uh, this, this actually is something I bought in Hoi An, and I, they told me it is genuine imitation silk. <laughs> and I, I would have worn it at the formal night, but I didn't want to be more formal than everybody else. But this is sort of the, the old style dress that you would have seen the scholars and the Mandarin officials in Hanoi back in the imperial era of that city. Uh, we were not um, getting too close to Hanoi on this trip because we're going up to Ha Long and docking uh, the late, the early this evening in uh, Thailand. Uh, and then some of you are going to Hanoi, but many of us are going out into the scenery in Ha Long Bay. And so again, I'm going to try to show you a bit of places that you will not be able to see on your journey in Vietnam, uh, but still appreciate uh, because we're close to this great capital of this country and then uh, we'll be on our way off to Hong Kong all too soon. Uh, but Hanoi is a, um, a, a city with a thousand year history and its, its name literally means within the lake, Hanoi, that means in, inside of a lake, which uh, if those of you who go to Hanoi will see that it's a city of lakes, uh, often with an island in the lake it's un, uh, not unlike that uh, classical Chinese city of Hangzhou, if you've been there with, with the w waters and then the l islands and then even lakes within the islands within the lake. And this is sort of a, uh, a, a magical uh, scenery for parts of Asia that is sometimes artificially constructed. But uh, Hanoi is also a city that is surrounded by the great river uh, delta of the Red River, the main river of North Vietnam. And in flood season, Hanoi, which is surrounded by uh, levees and dikes becomes a, a city in a lake when they have the great alluvial floods of this region. So I'm going to show you uh, some of the qualities of the land first. You have the um, North Vietnam region, which is essentially uh, what they call the head of the dragon, this great plain of the Red River Valley surrounded by mountains. And we, of course, have come up from uh, da Nang, and that's very mountainous all through here, so that this is the other region of Vietnam, which is somewhat uh, isolated from the other southern part of Vietnam. And of course, that's the history of the country. The, the, the divisions between the north, central, and the south have been the cause of uh, conflicts for centuries. But Hanoi is right in the center of the delta, and the Haiphong is the major port. We are sailing up to through Halong Bay to a point right about there, which is not not even on most maps and not even, I bought a map of Vietnam and our town where we're docking is so small it wasn't even on the map. But I did bring my, uh, my sea chart and I was up on the bridge to identify just where we are passing through and how, to, how we will be sailing through the great mountains and the sea of Halong Bay. If you want to see this chart after I finished, uh, you can welcome to study it. But uh, if you do get to up on deck this evening, we will be sailing right through the mountains and then coming uh, in the early evening to the small town of uh, Kailan, which is uh, our jumping off point to go to Hanoi and also out into the bay. It is, this town is on the mainland, but it's not the major port like Haiphong. Here, here again is Haiphong, which is, has a big uh, com uh, commercial dockage facilities and is not quite as charming as the course that the ship is taking. Now upland from Hanoi, the mountains rise almost immediately. Uh, as soon as you're out of this great uh, low-lying delta of the Red River, uh, this part of the world in Asia is uh, the beginning of going up into the Tibetan Plateau. From Vietnam up into Yunnan, Laos, there's uh, what I'd call a sea of mountains. It just goes on and on, ri rising higher and higher until you finally up onto the Tibetan Plateau where the Red River, like the Mekong, uh, flow from. And so you can see the rice paddies that are down and then faced by these very steep mountains. And this is what gives uh, the northern Vietnamese uh, a particular cultural heritage of struggling uh, through these mountains uh, being isolated by them from much of the rest of Asia, but then having this lush alluvial plain where they uh, have grown rice for centuries. And the mythical first king of Vietnam was 
uh, Honglak who taught the people how to grow rice. And so that has become the sustenance and the rice bowl of northern Vietnam. You can see in the higher mountains they have paddy terraces. This was also the site of some of the earliest uh, archaeological remains in Asia that go back about 100,000 years. But this is a, a bronze drum of what they call the Dongsan culture. It was about 3,000 years ago and is an example of the quality of the Bronze Age of this part of Asia. These um, artifacts are in the Fine Arts Museum in Hanoi. Up in the mountains there are over 60 different minority peoples. This is one of the uh, Ba people, very similar to Yunnan, where there's many, many different mountain, montagnards that were called in French. Uh, they still, some of them have traditional dresses, their own language. They're very uh, isolated in their mountain valleys, so they often come down to the market towns. But uh, s this is a, a vast area going all the way up, of course, again, to Tibet, where you have uh, regional mountain people, and then you have the incursion of the lowlanders. Now, um, uh, in China, it's the Han Chinese that have moved up the valleys. In Vietnam, it's the Viet, or they call themselves Kin people, that move up into the higher valleys and encounter these kind of people. Here's a woman in the past century smoking opium. Now, they still grow opium up in the mountains. It was generally for medicinal purposes, but when the French came and settled the, uh, the North Vietnam first and South Vietnam, they, they made opium plantations and then distributed it throughout the population. So opium became one of the curses of the Vietnamese people, just like it ha has happened in China. Further in the uh, mountain area, you can see how rough this is. Now this is something like uh, Halong Bay. These are mostly dolomite limestone mountains that um, have remained as the erosion of the rivers have, t have swept away the softer soil. So there's a thousand little villages all through the, ha the valleys and then as you come down into the plains you get the agriculture and you have the market uh, economy. They bring, bring wood down. You may have seen yesterday at the port in Da Nang they were bringing sticks like this from somewhere down to the port right in front of the ship and they had that giant pile of chips that was generated out of very small branches of trees that came from the Central Highlands. Uh, much of Vietnam has been deforested, first of all, by uh, war and then deforestation and then now logging. And so they have established a number of ecological preserves so that, and, and national parks so that they can save some of the remnant forests. Much of it is picked over. The population of the Red River Valley is the largest in Vietnam. It's fairly very fertile land and so it's packed with villages and farmers. Uh, here's a traffic jam up there. And then you have these vast fields that are seasonably, seasonally flooded in the, starting in late June, July, August. The monsoon comes and there's torrential rain all through this part of Vietnam and all through Southeast Asia. But with this very flat land, the rivers can rise up to 10 meters in the monsoon season. And so the Red River Valley has over 3,000 miles of levees to keep the settlements safe in the midst of all of this rain and flooding. Here's some of the farmers in their now flooded fields. Now this is, uh, for, for rice horticulture, this means that they can, they have to have an early spring crop before the rains come. They'll dry it out, harvest it. The, the flooding will happen and then they'll close the irrigation gates. They'll fill up their patties, plant the rice again and get two crops of rice up here. Now down in the Mekong, that, uh, Delta area, they get three crops a year because they can irrigate and it's, there's no winter down south. Up here in the north we get uh, colder winds coming off the mountains. Now the society in this particular region though is very much based in this kind of uh, irrigation control levees um, and this like in central China led to a very centralized government and a lot of social rigidity compared to those living in the easier uh, and often wilder south. So here's an, one of the ladies like we've seen all through Vietnam and yesterday those of us who walked through that um, Hoa Chau village saw the quality of the village life which is much centered around the clan house and the ancestor worships. Here is a funeral procession in the Red River Valley with the names of the deceased and then the coffin uh, coming along. And this is um, very much essential to the uh, past and the future life of uh, Vietnam that um, ancestors are worshipped. And we stopped at one of those temples and as with many of the older uh, temples in Vietnam. It had Chinese on it and uh, I stopped to read the inscription and it said that um, trees have roots, water has its source, mountains and the sea are eternal, 
and ancestors are always to be remembered. And one thing they will do is they not only offer incense, they'll take um, paper money, and I gathered it off the, off the street so you can see this uh, paper money that they will then put in the urn and they burn this for the uh, use in the afterlife. This is a mere 500,000 what they call the heaven money and this will be burnt up and it goes up to heaven. Uh, most curiously they had Ben Franklin on one of them uh, who's uh, uh, I guess he's worthy of ancestor worship too but only if he's green. Uh, anyway, it's, uh, these villages are very much a self-contained unit and even though there was strong political control exerted from Hanoi and the later capital Hue, uh, often the village would be its own compound, have its own defenses, and as they used to say, the power of the emperor stops at the village gate. The, the, the emperor must have benevolence and good policies, otherwise there'll be resistance in the, in the countryside. And the history of uh, Vietnam has many times of uh, revolts over the years and uprisings, and Hanoi was always uh, defending itself from its own people. Now, near Hanoi, I'm going to show you a place where we're not getting near. It's called Tam Dao Mountain. And this is an area that's going up towards uh, China and is typical of how rugged the uh, countryside is with uh, many uh, uh, sort of microecologies. And this has been made the uh, one of the national parks that's right outside the city. Uh, this is where French uh, colonialists would have a, a, a mountain home in the summer because it was cooler than the uh, low-lying hot plains. And so up in this area there are a lot of villages, as is true in some other countries. National parks doesn't mean people can't live there or have their farms. But it has a, a variety of curious creatures. Here's a leaf hopper, uh, a, uh, a multicolored beetle, and a, a kind of a cricket that has more legs than any cricket that I've ever had crawl on me. And then there's um, this kind of a crazy colored um, caterpillar that makes a very beautiful moth. And then there's a variety of reptiles. This is a, a leaf turtle, they call it, which uh, is, can camouflage itself on the ground. And, and, and as you've seen in other parts of Vietnam, snakes and these frogs and things end up in market uh, for dinner. Here's, here's a uh, freshly skinned snake that's still alive that is being prepared for extracting its bile, which is then used in medicinal wine. And if any of you have uh, gentlemen bought any of that snake wine, don't drink the whole bottle in one night. That's what I found out the other night. <laughs> um, but um, no, it's not. It's not true. I'm only pulling my own leg. Uh, but there's also these um, large wild uh, rodents. Those are like a South American capybara, and they are also brought into market for for dinner. And uh, one of the many wildlife in Vietnam that are now uh, trying. They're trying to keep the people from exterminating the last of this for the market food, and, and let them be as uh, as they wish to be as wild creatures. Oh, um, this is a very difficult segue from rats to emperors. This was the last emperor that I mentioned before uh, who I described in Hue in the imperial regime of uh, Vietnam that went on for a thousand years, originally from Hanoi, where it was founded, and then in 1802 the capital was moved to Hue when the North Viet, the Viet people had conquered all the way down to the Mekong Valley, and Bao Dai moved the capital uh, sorry, um, uh, Chao Long moved the capital, but Bao Dai was the last of the Nguyen um, emperors, and he abdicated to Ho Chi Minh in the deference. Uh, he had very little power to begin with and no army, and uh, he abdicated uh, for the establishment of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam as it is today. So Ho Chi Minh and uh, Vo Trung Giap, the general, uh, had been fighting the Japanese, they had been sponsored, first of all, by the Soviets and then the Americans uh, to be the resistance forces of the Viet Minh against the Japanese. And then when the Japanese suddenly withdrew, uh, Ho took his opportunity and declared independence. This is Badin Square in downtown Hanoi. And the Viet Minh, who were often up in China at Kunming, where our grandfather was an advisor at the time, came down through and came into Hanoi, and the, the French had yet to come back, though. They arrived a few months later. But meanwhile, Ho Chi Minh declared independence, and he read from the U.S. Declaration of Independence, and then he sent this uh, uh, t telegram to President Truman asking for support of his new government so that the French would not be allowed in, and the efforts to have an independent and unified Vietnam would go forward. But of course, this was also the time when the uh, World War II turned into the bitter Cold War, the Korean War, 
And so the Truman Doctrine of containing communism meant that Ho was left out in the cold. Then he went back to the Russians and to the Chinese for support, and the troubles continued from there. Now, uh, General Jiap was a uh, brilliant tactician. He had been fighting the Japanese. Then he, um, when the French came back into Haiphong, bombarded the harbor, sent Marines ashore, and took Hanoi again, they realized that they had to fight the French um, very, a very difficult fight because uh, they were always under-equipped and uh, they were chased up into the mountains and the, the French were certainly better equipped and uh, they went out into the, up the upper mountains and then they finally had their last stand at Dien Bien Phu. The um, French thought that they would uh, have a showdown with Jap and the North Vietnamese, the Viet Minh I should say, uh, in these mountains so they built a, a entrenched uh, facility with an airfield artillery and they were waiting for the Viet Minh to attack and they thought this would be the decisive battle. Well, the, the French depended upon airdrops and the airport and resupply. They, this was an area with no town and it was a sort of a mountaintop fortress that then was surrounded by the Viet Minh who then unleashed incredible artillery and human wave assaults and finally overwhelmed the French even though they were dropping in from the sky and got some relief but it was a, a terrible defeat for the French as you know. Uh, they finally had to surrender and withdraw. Uh, there was, it was another, let's say, uh, Pyrrhic victory for the Viet, Viet Minh because they lost the estimated eight, eight to 9,000 men versus about 600 French. Uh, but nonetheless, that shocked the French nation and the world that uh, the French army would be defeated yet again. But to the credit of the um, Vietnamese, they have kept the cemetery at Dien Bien Phu, so many a French traveler will now go up there and, and honor the deceased in that terrible battle. But what that did is led to the Geneva Conference in 1954 where the French and the Ho Chi Minh's government and numerous other, the British government and others, agreed that there would be a unified Vietnam under the leadership of Ho and the Viet Minh, but the, the holdout was Ngo Dinh Yem, who, was, who refused to go to the conference representing his interests in South Vietnam. And as described, he was a very stubborn man. And then also the U.S. government sat out and thereby did not participate in what might have been a historical finish to this difficulty. But as you know, it went on and then uh, the U.S supported, advised the South Vietnamese. And then in 1964, there was this, the Tonkin Gulf Incident, which has been uh, picked over by a number of historians, saying that the, uh, it was a provocation and it really was not an, out, an attack on the American Navy in international waters, but actually, here's the historic track of the Maddox, which was the vessel that was attacked. And you can see it was uh, all but brushing the beaches of North Vietnam while it was steaming around, and then thereby gave the press uh, incident that then left to the, led to the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which then led to the war that was never formally declared or approved by Congress by the Constitution. But nonetheless, it went on where even there were some Chinese MiGs that got involved in the skirmishes over North Vietnam. But the war was contained so the Chinese would not come in on the side of the Vietnamese who did not want Chinese troops in their country again after their long history of uh, trouble. But if you've been to the... Um, the museum in New York City, the uh, USS Intrepid, the great aircraft carrier that survived World War II, its last action was in the Gulf of Tonkin, and it sortied and, and had uh, air skirmishes with the Chinese Air Force. Uh, and curiously, in New York, if you go to the aircraft carrier on the West Side Piers, the great aircraft carrier is parked right across the street from the Chinese consulate residence to remind them of the period. They don't, they don't like to see it every morning. Anyway, the war went on and on and of course it created great devastation. Uh, the Vietnamese, as Ho famously said, would lose 10 men to any one, but as he said, we will win anyway. And it was true with the French and finally with the Americans. And this was a classic a asymmetrical warfare and the, the, the Vietnamese call it the horde of grasshoppers attacking the elephant, which is much of what happened. The greater power of these technical forces were finally defeated. Uh, but on a lighter side, there's another uh, proverb or story in Vietnamese, which is how did the mouse make the elephant laugh? <laughs> <laughs>